Hi, I'm Izzy Barrett. I'm the Artistic Director of the National Youth Jazz Collective. Welcome to our hashtag National Youth Jazz Wednesday, our usual weekly live stream where we have the opportunity to uh, talk at length, which we often don't get because we're all whizzing from one project to the next with uh, dear colleagues and friends and young musicians that we work with um, from the jazz sector. So it's not necessarily always musicians. Bit of a hint there about who we're going to be talking to later on, all members of the jazz community. So Nick, how are you doing? Come and say hello. Hello, good evening everybody. I'm Nick Brown. I'm the Programme Manager for the National Youth Jazz Collective. And um, we've been sort of very busily involved in separate things. I've been doing lots of fundraising and sort of putting the business plans in place for our next round of MPO funding. And you've been doing lots of other things. And there was one meeting that you went to that I would love you to tell us all about because it sounded really intriguing. And that was a meeting that you went to with Music for Youth. And yes. I'm wondering if you might tell us about what it was, what it involved and whether it's in its development stage or if it's already up and running. Yeah, so Music for Youth um, have something up and running, but they're looking at ways that we can get other things, get us involved as a National Youth Music Organisation. Um, so they currently have something called The Future Is Now, which is their campaign that they've had together uh, over COVID. Um, and that's kind of utilizing all kind of the video recordings and, and things and putting together and having one one space online um, where all those videos from schools and music services can sit um, and for people to go to and watch which is which is a really nice resource so you can see kind of how people have been creating music and creating music uh, during these times and of course the NIMO is no ex exception to that um, just like we did with, with our summer school so we're thinking about how we can put our videos on that resource as well. And then we can have that whole progression from um, school level all the way to national level, which is gonna be an, an amazing resource. So we're gonna do a call out in our newsletter, which is gonna go out in the next week, possibly two weeks, but definitely before Easter, inviting the young musicians and uh, the educators that we work with. They'd like to contribute videos for us to start sharing on our Wednesdays, because I think we're gonna start doing some live performance performances sort of this month really or before starting we're going to launch it before easter and then we can also connect those videos to um music for youth as well i've had a really great time talking to lots of music services about you know future projects everyone's very excited about the 15th birthday next year and lots of videos um, they've shared lots of videos with me during those conversations and some fantastic things happening around the uh, the country so we're really looking forward to plugging all those together and seeing what we've uh, what we've all been up to and one of the festivals is actually going to be called um covid in real life no lockdown in real life and it's actually all the stuff that they've been working in glossop or the stuff that they've been working on during lockdown they're now going to have a festival where they perform it all so instead of us trying to bring what we were doing into lockdown now they're taking lockdown into real life so i'm looking forward to we're going to invite them to one of our wednesdays so they can come and talk to us all about it and share what they've been doing so talking of videos and sharing what people have been doing we're really excited about uh, future projects that we're developing at the moment with where we're introducing the element of dance because jazz and dance are really important it's a very important component of the music making and it's also it's a raison d'etre for a lot of the repertoire but also you know, it's got a really significant history and, and influence and it's something that in jazz education is rarely talked about when i was at trinity college of music even though we were partnered with the Laban, um, uh, what were they called, Laban School of Dance? Or oh, I can't remember, they're just called Laban. But um, there was very little crossover and very little conversation about that relationship. And I'm really keen over the next year for us to make dance a really important part of what NYJC does. We're a National Youth Jazz Collective. So it's not necessarily just music, it can be all elements. So we've invited three guests who um, got in touch with us and have been doing projects of their own uh, and we want to develop things. And we thought it would be really nice to introduce you to everyone. So the first person I'm going to call up to the stage, there's a very funny story in that I got a message through Facebook asking whether NYJC would be interested in taking part in a project. And I'd actually got the top name on my to-do list of people that I wanted to get in touch with about future projects. So it was like this synchronicity of the top line of my to-do list and the, the name of the, the person who wrote the message that came in on Facebook, and that was Annette Walker. So Annette, come to the stage and say hello. 
Hi, hi, Izzy. Hi. I still can't get over that. It was like, what? It was, it was just incredible because we hadn't spoken to each other for a year, we, you know, because of lockdown. And I think we last saw each other at the Women in Music Breakfast. That was right, yeah. The South Bank. And that was quite a while ago. And we hadn't talked about any collaboration or projects. We just knew of each other and always, you know, greeted each other with fondness, had a good old catch up. But it's great. So I was very excited when we got when I got the message. I'm wondering um, if you might introduce yourself, Annette, so that people can uh, see what your involvement is with jazz and dance. Yes, of course. So um, I'm a tap dancer primarily. Um, I'm also a musician, so I do play the piano, as you might spot. <laughs> background there <laughs> um but my tap dancing is rooted in jazz music and improvisation so i have worked with companies um and i've done choreography uh but i work primarily um almost as part of the band so a percussionist uh, in the band i've been doing that for for many years uh and i'm always really excited of like making new collaborations um working with musicians because there's so many different places that you can go with it yes so that, that's not a you there, there's a big history isn't there so that came out of various yeah. traditions but the, yeah. the earliest i personally had seen when i was aware of it was the was the twins that danced with cab calloway and I'm wondering if you might sort of talk about that a little bit just to sort of contextualize that and obviously i did some projects with will gain so i sort of worked with him and that relationship between tap dance and drumming you know and it really is part of the, the rhythm section isn't it the tap dance Yes, I mean, Will Gaines was one of my um, like mentors. He, he didn't really teach, but he was, in fact, he was one of the reasons I actually improvised um, performing because I saw him and I was like, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> when was that? When, how old were you and when was that? That was, oh gosh, uh, maybe the early 2000s, I think. And um, he, he was always really enthusiastic about seeing the young up and coming tap dancers. Mm. He worked primarily with musicians. He was a, he called himself a bebop hoofer or a jazz hoofer. He didn't actually like to use the word tap dance. Um, and he would have these uh, jams often for his birthday where he'd invite all these great musicians um, and do a call out to like the young up and coming tap dancers. At the time, I wasn't accustomed to performing and improvise. It was mainly studio with your friends. Um, and you know, I'd get this call and, and Will would be like, yeah, go on, off you go. <laughs> Literally push me on the stage. And I'd be like, what's going on? <laughs> and it was like proper improvising because sometimes I wouldn't even know what the song was. <laughs> and it was like, you, you had to just get in the moment. Um, yeah. And in some respects, it can be quite terrifying. You know, it could it could be quite scary. But the environment was always so welcoming. The musicians were always so supportive. Um, and Will was always so excited that you just kind of got swept away with the excitement of everything that was going. And like, yes, I'm going to dance now. <laughs> and then you would go. Um, but a lot of the history, yes, of, of tap dancers, particularly of Will's generation, the bebop hoofers, um, primarily uh, were working with, with musicians. And even prior to that, in the swing kind of era, uh, Duke Ellington and the, the bands, they always had dancers, um, you know, and touring uh, the circuits wasn't just about his music. It was like his music and dance and this whole experience. And at some point, um, you know, it, it kind of got a bit divided and the music went off in kind of one direction and the tap dancers, the work disappeared and a lot of them kind of went a bit underground and had to get other jobs. Uh, but there was a resurgence of tap, I think the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of brought them out of retirement. And then there's a new generation of uh, dancers who are interested in learning uh, that history. Uh, so, you know, they find a little studio somewhere and there were only sometimes a handful of them, but they were just really eager to you know, learn what this history was. And this was in America, this was happening in New York and I think in other, other places. Uh, and then during, I think the late 70s and the early 80s, you had like Gregory Hines, who was like an ambassador for tap dancing. They really started to kind of build the community. Um, <laughs> and at that stage, I'm not sure what was happening much in the UK, but there was little pockets of tap around Europe, um, kind of a legacy of the jazz era. So from the musical theater days, from the kind of like jazz uh, band touring days, 
they were still little pockets, but they weren't very much, they weren't very connected. Um, and I think Save Young Glover's show in the 90s kind of like put stage back on Broadway into the limelight. And mm -hmm. since then, it's just been steadily growing. Um, and myself, when I was kind of getting into tap, there wasn't, there weren't many kind of like people I could see doing it and say, that's something I'm going to go and do. It was a case of, this is something I like doing. It, it started very much of a case of something I like doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pursue doing that. But at the time I wasn't thinking I'm going to go and become a tap dancer because it wasn't a thing. <laughs> It wasn't the thing. When did you actually first see it? What you know, and the type of you know, like the um, in the context that we're talking about. When did you? How? What made you aware of it? Gosh. Um, well, it's just. I think what's interesting is that the context that I first saw tap dancing was in the movies, the old black and white movies, the MGM musicals, um, and quite often you'd see like Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly. Uh, I really, when I was quite young, got into um, Shirley Temple because because she was young. So I'd watched the Shirley Temple movies, but I was only interested in the ones that she was dancing in. And it's only later that I realized that the, the guy that she was partnered with was Bill uh, Robinson, Bo Jangles. Because yeah. when I was young, I didn't know any names or have any context. It was a case of, I watched this on the, scr on the screen or on TV. And then I would go to like dance classes at my local dance school, which just seemed to be completely different. So it was like th these things in kind of parallel. Um, it's only when I kind of, um, you know, came across like Will Gaines and, and then a friend of mine, uh, Junior Lanyon, was teaching Rhythm Tap at Pineapple Dance Studios and he started dropping these names in the historical context. And I'd n in the, I think, 11 years that I'd been learning tap, I'd never heard these names before. And I was like, what? And it suddenly was like, there's this whole history that suddenly started to appear. And I was like, more please <laughs> yeah I, I totally forgotten about bojangles with shirley temples that i'd forgotten about and also pineapple studios that's still covent garden yeah yeah that's still that's still going in, in, in covent garden i mean i there were um only a handful of tap classes and by the time i was uh, like a young adult i was quite an advanced tap dancer because most um classes available for adults were beginners um, and the style of tap dancing that I was looking for at the time was very difficult to find. Um, there was uh, a guy called Derek Hartley, who I believe is still teaching at Pineapple, who did an, an American style of, of tap dancing, um, which is more akin, I think, to kind of like the, the musicals, which is, is interesting because there's a division, a change in a lot of the tap that happens in Britain compared to America. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, but Junior was teaching the um, the kind of hoofing style, which had the improvising, which had this whole other element that I'd never seen in all the years of tap dancing. I'd never seen anything like it. And I remember going into the studio, they've got these little windows um, and I'd look in from the reception and they were doing a call and response. And it made absolute sense to me, it made perfect sense to me. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> And how much of it was freestyle and how much of it was choreographed well, in the, um, the lessons? There was, there was a lot more, um, there's a lot more kind of uh, choreographed uh, and set exercises. You know, I think you, you build your tools from improvising. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do lots of exercises, very much how like you, we play with music. You, you have lots of different types of things that you do and then you have the space to play around with it to kind of like investigate it and in juniors classes we used to have these hour and a half lessons where it was an hour you'd spend you know a warm-up you would do some exercises and then you'd spend maybe a good 30 or 40 minutes learning a routine mm -hmm. and then the last half hour was improvising and we'd get into a circle and I remember the very first time I got into the circle and I was like what do I do <laughs> oh what what do I do it's like yeah do like anything that you want and I was like what, what, does, that mean? <laughs> what does that mean so but from there um I, I just got s I always loved tap and that just made me so excited even though I had no idea what I was doing I just loved that idea that I could do anything um and so you know I traveled around to get the training because you know it's quite limited in the UK so I found some of these old guys I, I went to the States, I went to the festivals, um, the new generation of uh, teachers that were traveling around Europe, I would go to the festivals. 
um, and I would go and take classes and workshops with them. Um, and I, it was, there was a small group of us in the UK that had this love of tap. And so we would get together and jam. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we formed a company from that. You know, so there would be a, a number, how many uh, tap dancers are in that were in that company? So, so we can evoke a picture of it in our um, mind. Between four and five. I mean, we started off, I think, with five. Um, we were called the uh, About Time Tap Company. Um, and I mean, we performed on and off between, I'm going to say 2000 and we started off like 2002, 2003. We had a bit of a, a, a break. Um, for a few years and then kind of reformed because we lived in different parts of the country. We weren't yeah. always in London. So we were working with people who were in Brighton or in Manchester. So you can see like logistics. <laughs> we were really excited, but it was not easy to get us together. <laughs> and we were self-funded. We didn't have any additional funding. So it was around our work, around our lives, but we just all wanted to make it work. So, um, I mean, we ended up uh, performing at the, I don't know if you remember the London 2012 Cultural Olympiads, where they did these mm -hmm. kind of like, um, um, you know, festivals, of dance and music, celebrating the fact that we had won the bid to put on the Olympics back in like 2008, 2009. Um, one of the performances we did was at Greenwich Dance, it was called, called Greenwich Dance Agency at the time. And we brought in Will Gaines. Oh. <laughs> so I, I remember that um, because, Will was so excited as well. He was just like, wow, let's, yeah, let's do more. He was really... He was a very excitable person. Sadly, he's passed away now, but uh, we did... Um, so he had that partnership with Ellington, and I think it was that partnership that brought him over to the UK. And if I remember rightly from what he said, the usual tap dancer that Duke Ellington worked with didn't like to fly. And so yeah. Will realised that if he stayed based in the UK, then every time Ellington came to Europe he would be the go-to tap dancer. So that was... Yes, because the, the... Yeah, so the, the dancer that uh, Duke used, who, who actually was labelled Duke's dancer, was Bunny Briggs, um, another bebop dancer. Oh, yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, I actually went and met Bunny. I, I flew out to Vegas and spent an after... He was such a lovely, lovely, humble um, dancer, just a great human being. Um, and he told me his story. He told me about Bill Robinson turning up on his doorstep and inviting, he was about eight or something, inviting him to come and do the show. But um, Bunny's um, mother was really religious and was like, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> um, and, you know, he told me the story of how he en ended up uh, working in a troupe called the Whitman Sisters, who are another kind of unsung kind of heroines of the Black Vaudeville circuit. A lot of the dancers and hoofers that got their training and their start in, in show, um, showbiz uh, went through the Whitman Sisters group. Oh. Um, so yeah, so I had, I had all, all these stories that we've, we've got in a few books, but it was just so different to have someone telling that story. And TAP is an oral history. It's an oral art form. So yeah. it's a big, we get really excited <laughs> about having these stories and meeting people and hearing them it's like it's almost like you hear them for the, you know them but it's like you hear them for the first time every single time so when will um when will was telling his story because um last year i actually did a, a talk about will's life and tap dancing um it, you know it's a hoofer's story it's it embeds the music and the dance into who he is how he ended up here um you know where he what journey he took um and yes he he had i think it was 19 early 60s that he ended up in in the uk and it got to a point where when i started getting into jazz music which i got into through tap it was specifically because i wanted to have more of a connection with the music and and write arrangements and have a conversation with the musicians that i went back and studied jazz um but now i was now uh, meeting the musicians and anytime I mentioned tap dance, they'd be like, oh, do you know Will Gaines? Like everywhere around the country. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, he was the, he was the biz, wasn't he? He was, we did um, the sacred concert with a big band and choir at um, Dartington Summer School. And I was asked to direct the orchestra and the choir. And then we had um, Jackie Danquith was the solo soprano. And then they said, and Will is going to come and join you. And we, you know, we did proper fully 
uh, rehearsals and then we did a great big performance and just the magic of suddenly when he stepped out and danced in the performance and I was like wow and the connection that you know the thread between him and he had worked with Ellington and now this orchestra was playing Ellington's music you know it was all like we were all suddenly in the same moment and uh, and the magic I mean the musicians the way they played to his tap dancing because it just you know it just it, it's they just coasted along. It was effortless because he, he, his tap dancing was just unbelievable. It's amazing because he's not a, he wasn't a schooled dancer. He didn't go to, a, you know, some people go to dance school and learn. He, he literally learned off the streets. He was very much a case of he saw it. I think he was inspired by people like uh, Teddy, Teddy Hale, who was a, an improvising tap dancer um, uh, back, in the, back in the day. Uh, and he was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Um, and you know you pick up things once you've focused uh, yeah. and uh, I think he ended up like winning a competition or a talent contest when he was living uh, maybe in Detroit I think at the time and it just took off from there he he was you know getting bookings and traveling around the states and you know becoming a hoofer effectively so he was a real old school um, learn it off the streets hoofer he was born in the same city as Dizzy Gillespie. He was listening to the, the music in the clubs. Exactly, that's the really important thing, isn't it? He was of the time, he was of the music. That time and it was that was what he was yeah. hearing and that was what he was embodying. He didn't read music, he didn't do routines. He didn't do any choreography. I don't think he even knew some of the standard routines that we use in tap, which are, you know, um, are quite popular uh, around the world. He did his own thing, but he was so in the music you could you could see and you could hear it yeah he lived and breathed it and that was what i think was so exciting about when when he came out on stage it just came out absolutely and he could turn on a penny so he was in everything he did he was in the moment his whole personality was in the moment and any music that was playing he would just suddenly he would be of it it was unbelievable it was the most immediate person i think i've ever come across yeah. and to manifest itself so physically in his entire body as well that was the other thing you know we've come across people that could pick up a horn and play a solo but i mean it was his whole body so um are there any films that you could recommend for people that are watching just to introduce them so they could go youtube's got quite a lovely selection yeah thing. so there's actually lots of Tap dancing in old films are little clips. You know, you have to go through like sometimes the whole movie. But the great thing about YouTube is that you don't have to watch the whole movie. You can go straight to the clips. Um, probably some of the most popular and favourites of the Nicholas Brothers. Um, and the most out, outstanding routine that they did was a Stormy Weather um, 1943 uh, with Cab Calloway. Uh, it's just I can watch that over and over again. It just blows my mind. <laughs> Thinking about it, it, it is truly amazing. Yeah, yeah, and I and I like um, uh, sometimes what I like about showing footage is also putting into context that these are film productions, so they didn't record the sound and the visuals at the same time. So you have this other layer of like what they dubbed the taps back on watching that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about YouTube is once you find that um, clip, like you say, that you can see it as an extract, then YouTube t sort of recommends if you like this, then, and they do tend to be lots of other really interesting yeah, so the, in the thread. Yeah, the Nicholas Brothers is definitely one. There's also the uh, Condos Brothers, who are another American, um, I think Greek-American Greek, Greek -American, um, duo, mm -hmm. of this kind of same um, era. Uh, if you want to go back quite early, then Bill Robinson, Bojangles. There's, you know, some of his uh, solo work. Um, and there's not as much um, of the women, but um, you can find Jenny Lagon. I think there's a, a couple oh, yeah. of her early, early tap. I actually met Jenny Lagon as well. <laughs> oh my gosh, fantastic! Thank goodness you did as well, because you're passing it on. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was. This, this is the thing. I think when, when she kind of like. When you kind of discover that these these people were still there, you're like, what? <laughs> I was like, I was straight on the plane. I yeah. I was um, I was planning to meet like Gregory Hines, um, but unfortunately he had to cancel the con um, the festival that I was at, and it turned out later th the next year he passed away. So you know we later discovered that he'd been suffering from cancer. Yeah, um, but he also left a massive legacy and because he's done films and done lots of television you just type in Gregory Hines tap 
um, and you see like a, particularly from like the 80s and the 90s a whole kind of suite um, the PBS special Tap Dance in America he brings in like the old generation and the new generation of the time and that's another really good one um, to kind of like get a whole sense um, of what was happening in um, in America as tap dance was kind of like being brought back. So yeah, there's, I mean, I, yeah, I, I get lost in, in clips and my most recent um, kind of research, because I do a lot of research in, in tap as well, is of a choreographer who was called Buddy Bradley, who was, um, he is one of his students was called Henry Letang, who was yeah. a choreographer on the West End uh, in the Broadway in America and, and took over from like Buddy Bradley's work. Buddy ended up in the UK and actually um, choreographed the first British musical film. And he was choreographing on the West End throughout the thirties, uh, jazz dance, you know, Charleston, Black Bottom, slow drag, tap dancing. But he was also um, using ballet, ballroom, the whole thing, it's a choreographer. Um, and I've just literally been finding his works through the films that he choreographed for because he didn't get any credits in the US for the stage shows that he did. But for all the work that he did, or most of it, he's got credits in the UK. So I've been going through the list and trying to find all the footage. Um, and I'll be presenting a, a talk about his work because he's very much kind of unsung hero. You know, not many people know about him and his influence in, in jazz and tap. And I've got a friend who is a great tap dancer and her teacher was taught by Buddy Bradley. So it is like the we have a lineage as well. We have yeah. a history. Um, talk. Is it available? Can people watch yes, it? I'll be, I'll be um, it'll be hosted through the Tap Dance Research Network UK on Wednesday, the 17th of March. It will be at 7 p.m. UK time. Um, and yeah, I'll be kind of hosting an hour and a half. Um, so we'll start with a presentation of like the background of where he was from, his journey to the UK, and then showing footage and talking about his style and who his were, who he, you know, his, the legacy that he's left in the UK. I mean, there's so many things that, that have come up that uh, one was the fact that he choreographed the first, he co-choreographed the first British jazz ballet. Wow. With the company that at the time was called the Ballet Club, which is now known as Rombert. Oh, ta-da! Well, I know that everybody would love to join on Sunday. So it's this Sunday, is that right? The 7th? No, sorry, it's on, it's on the 14th, uh, oh. sorry, 17th. Oh. 17th. It's 17th of March, so it's, it's yeah. two. Great. And um, also, you know, things like, it's not necessarily tap related, but it's dance and music related, is a lot of people might think, well, they don't, you know, I don't know much about this relationship between dance and music from this oh. background, but, you know, things like um, Scott Joplin, and if you go online and watch his ballet, uh, his opera rather, it's got lots of dance in it, lots of the tempi that he chose to write for in, you know, the actual ragtime is like a drag and a cakewalk. They're all really heavily influenced by dance. So just to sort of open it up a bit for anyone that's watching, thinking, I'm not sure I've come across this relationship between, Very you know, you have actually without realising it. Yeah. It's an extremely strong relationship. I mean, the the dances, the the dances of the day, the the popular dances of the day, the jazz, the they now call them the authentic jazz dance, but the authentic jazz dances of the day that were done in the social clubs, in the ball, in you know, in the ballrooms, um, the um, like the Lindy Hop, which is like a, a combination of a lot of those different styles of of jazz dances. Um, for instance, um, the Count Basie. Uh, would have been like touring, you know, with these uh, shows for the dancers. This the musicians' work was yeah. playing for the dancers. <laughs> really? Really? Well, I know you've made a wonderful video to share with us, and I think before we go on and, and welcome our other two guests that are with us today, um, I wondered if you might. Nick's going to play the video, but might you just give us a a quick. What's sort of the heading of the, what heading would you give the video that you've created? What is it? Oh. You <laughs> so the, the video that I've created is a demonstration of the um, time step or one of the many time steps that are in tap. It's kind of, Great. Kind of single time step, which is a, um, an eight bar phrase uh, that it's like, it's like a key step in, in, in tap. Basically, oh, yeah. you're a tap dancer, you can do a time step. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Let's see what it is, and then we can. Uh, you've also got a lovely explanation about it as well. So, and I and the bookends are where you are demonstrating. So we see it, we hear about it, we see it again, which I think is a lovely way to um, really get into what what this newness of what we're talking about. Many of us are not familiar. So over to you, Nick. One, two, three, wait. One. Two, three, break. Time steps are a fundamental element of tap dancing. They are an eight bar structure, traditionally done as a three repeated steps in a break, which is done twice to create the eight bars, um, or as six repeated bars and a two bar break. The name time step comes from its description, a time step, that is, dancers would use it to set the tempo for the bands to join them rather than counting. There are lots of different time steps. It's quite common for dancers to create their own. Um, many routines, traditional routines and new routines, actually start with the time step um, as a structure, an eight bar structure to get into the rest of the routine. For example, the Shim Sham and the BS Chorus all have their own time steps. I'm going to go right back to basics uh, and I'm going to introduce you to a single shuffle time step which is related to the buck time step. For dancers, there's often an element of symmetry that's important in the phrasing so that the three, bar, the three repeated bars in the break, the first time round starts on the right foot and then the second time round it starts on the left foot. One, two, three. One, two, three, break. Yeah, brilliant. And I know we're going to be doing a lot more of that over the next year, integrating your work into working with us in the regions and on the summer school, heading into our 15th birthday. But for now, Annette, I'd like to thank you for sharing your, um, your part of your journey, a snapshot of your journey. There's so much more else to talk about, but to introducing that to everybody. And, and we're going to welcome a duo in a moment that you've been working with a lot. So I wondered if you might actually do the introduction and contextualise how you first met. Oh, yeah, no, certainly. So um, we met online, like most things are these days. Um, it was, uh, I was, I think it was actually through Instagram, like an in Instagram message. We'd, we'd passed, I think, each other in spaces, you know, at the South Bank, when you have like social dances and things going on. Um, but uh, Nancy sent me a, a message and it was basically, you know, they've got this project uh, working uh, with Lindy Hop um, and they want to work with jazz musicians, would I be interested? I'm like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> um, and it kind of started from there. And um, um, we were building the project from the ground up. It was a, It's an English heritage uh, funded project. Uh, right. quite so should we bring them to the stage? Collaboration last year. Uh, and Nancy should we bring them to the stage and then, and then they can join in that sort of explaining yeah. what the project was. It was more the introduction. Brilliant. Yeah. Yes, so to the stage, thank you so much, my love. Can we welcome to the stage Nancy Hitzig and Kat Foley? Hello. 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 You call yourselves Swing Sister Swing. So Nancy, might you uh, introduce the duo, first of all, and how you both came about to be called Swing Sister Swing? Sure. Um, so I'm Canadian. Uh, I moved to London seven, uh, almost eight years ago. And I've had the pleasure over the last five years, particularly to be working with um, one of my best friends and one of the best collaborators a person can ask for, Kat Foley. And I've been dancing Lindy Hop. Kat and I, interestingly, have both been dancing swing dance the same length of time. And we also both happen to be instrumentalists. So I was a double bassist um, in, my, in my misspent youth. Um, and Kat was a clarinetist. And uh, we started this partnership because we saw there were not a lot of opportunities for women in jazz dance to be able to tell stories that were important to us. So this is something that we sort of took upon ourselves in striking up Swing Sister Swing, which is a take on the song Swing Brother Swing. Uh, but of course we are here for all people and it's been such a pleasure to work with Annette and to be talking to you about how we might uh, be taking things forward over the next couple of years. But um, maybe hand it over to you, Kat. 
Yeah, absolutely. A little background about the type of dancing that we do. Um, so uh, Nancy and I are both specialists in African-American vernacular dances, which goes all the way from kind of the 1890s and dances, as you mentioned yourself, Izzy, such as the cakewalk and things that you would dance to ragtime music, going into hot jazz era and things like the Charleston and the Black Bottom, and all the way into just the cusp of rock and roll uh, with dances that you might have heard of, like the Lindy Hop, that are partnered improvised dances. So these are dances that are completely uncodified. Um, you cannot take an exam in Lindy Hop. You cannot go to university for Lindy Hop. Um, you learn it by osmosis. And as Annette said, the, the, the oral histories and how we pass that, that information down is super important. And same as yourself, um, Annette, Nancy and I have both spent a lot of time to really seek out those original dances and get the authentic stories about what it is that we're we're doing it, it, as you know to non uh, african american people but there's such a great community all over the world the biggest swing dance community at the present day is actually in south korea which wow. is the coolest um, and i was very lucky that i got funding a few years ago to go to south korea to ask two main questions how is swing dancing so huge in South Korea? But also, um, how, how does gender um, play a part in partnered swing dancing, especially the, as someone from the UK? How does that transpire outside of the UK? Um, because what we observe in the swing dance community is um, a much more open-minded approach, I think, to gender, certainly even at competitive level, than, say, you, you do maybe in the ballroom community. If you think about Strictly and how long it took to have a same, a same gender partnership mm -hmm. presented on television, um, it's a long journey. And that's the thing that me and Nancy are really passionate about. It's about giving that platform to women and non-binary people and to try and eliminate the question for us of where are the men? So Nancy, um, how did you first get into, what, what, when, when did it catch your eye and you thought, I want to do that? Kat is smiling at me because this story, she she's officially heard too many times, which <laughs> is that my first Lindy Hop class, I was the third wheel on a date. And I was 16 years old and I was in a uh, what a, 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 an infamous dusty ballroom in the city of Toronto called the Dover Court House. And I always knew what Lindy Hop was. I'd, I'd grown up listening to traditional jazz and my father was a big swing jazz fan. And I went to this dance because my friend asked me to go. I don't even remember the name of the woman that he was on a date with. And I just, the, the I, I remember being in the circle and the feeling of being in a social dance and the music they were playing was bassy. And I just thought there's something here for me and there was something about being in this collective space and the energy of what we make together that we don't make when we're apart um, that really stayed with me and inspired me to take up the dance. And I, uh, I think being able to know that there's something I can bring to the dance in the process is really exciting. So that, that's sort of what brought me to it. But I always laugh because I, I don't have many memories. I think back to that how awkward that class was, but I still wanted to come back. And I think the music was such a, a big part of that. Kat, how was it for you? Well, I'm, I'm very spoiled. My uh, first memory of live music is actually a jazz band. So my great uncle was a jazz piano player and all of our family parties were soundtracked by like a big band, <laughs> which was amazing. I learned to, uh, learned to dance Charleston with me gran in the kitchen. And my grandpa actually danced tap as a, as a young man as well. Um, but I actually started Lindy Hop specifically at university um, and I could see the class from my bedroom window and the music came through, came through the window. So even if I felt not sure if I wanted to dance today, I'd hear the music and I'd go, oh, it, it does, it moves the soul certainly for me. Um, and the idea of improvising with a person, I mean, it, there's something magic that happens there when, you know, you don't both do something you weren't expecting because it's kind of like it's you, your partner and the music. I've got a friend who calls it the love triangle, that you're, you're making this improvisation with another person and with a musician. And certainly the first time that I danced to a live band and you realise if you get close enough that the musician is, is playing with you and then you're playing with your partner, it's, I mean, for me, it's something that I, it brings me the most joy in the world. 
What was the history, Nancy, of the Lindy Hop? When did it first start to happen? Well, I mean, if we start talking about um, Lindy Hop, then we have to go back to the 1880s. And if we want to go back to the 1880s in America, then we also have to go back to the transatlantic um, uh, slave trade and how that influences popular dances and communities in America at the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. um, and I think specifically if we're talking about Lindy Hop and vernacular jazz, we're, we're talking about being in Harlem in the 1920s, in the black community, and it's happening alongside. So the music is evolving and changing and becoming this very exciting thing. And the dance styles are evolving alongside the music to be able to reflect the rhythm Mm -hmm. of what's happening and so you have uh incredible amounts of social mobility for lots of different groups of people and one of the most famous troops that's part of that is whitey's lindy hoppers um whitey was the manager of the savoy ballroom which spanned a whole city block and had two bandstands and on you know some nights you would have chick webb on one side and you have count basie on the other uh, and it was a very exciting place to be but the people who were dancing in the room weren't just specialists in lindy hop and this new dance style they also could dance all of the different ballroom dances and all of these other forms because they were all part of popular culture and this was the popular music. So that's kind of the setting of where we are. And, um, and I don't wanna steal thunder of the things that perhaps we'll see later in this segment, but um, you'll get to see uh, a clip of Whitey's Lenny Hoppers a, a little bit later and we can talk a bit about them. So in, in a moment, we, Kat and Nancy both put little videos together to sort of help similar what thing to what Annette was doing. But I'm wondering as a pair when you're dancing, you know, we talked about ballroom dancing and there is very much the sort of the, the, the is choreographed most of that. And there's, there's that sense of someone is leading as well. Is there the kind of sign, is there, is there the choreography and the, the leadership relationship within the Lindy Hop as well? When you're talking about improvisation, is it, both people are equal and you're basically just ebbing and flowing and really like a, a shoal of fish or a, you know, a flock of birds, you're really responding to each other? This is such a good question. Uh, really very much so. Um, absolutely, there is a there can be a choreographed element to to Lindy Hop, of course. Um, and if you're performing, for example, you might you might choreograph something. Um, and the improvisation um, is probably quite similar to Annette was what Annette was talking about and describing in that as you as you grow as a dancer you build a vocabulary and it's the same with music right you kind of you build a vocabulary um and as you get more experienced your um, muscle memory and like cognitive ability to understand that those different movements are happening you know you you move through it more easily so where, where if you see a room full of people all dancing to a band none of that is choreography zero mm -hmm. but there will be figures and ultimately when i describe the dance there's really only a couple of things you can think of. Turn or do not turn. Move or do not move. <laughs> um, so with a partner, there's, there is a sense that there's often a lead and follow role. But um, I think that what's really important in Lindy Hop is that this is not lead and follow. It's it's lead and follow. So the the, the follower in, in, in their role is offering just as much as the lead is, is, is offering in their role. Which is very jazz. That's what an ensemble is doing, a jazz ensemble. That exactly. Is so that's why it's such a wonderful partner and partnering. And I'm thinking just to say to everybody that's watching, if you've got any questions, please do pop them in the comments on Facebook because um, Nick will forward them to us and we'll definitely answer them. And also just to reiterate that we are not looking to do moments where we're featuring dancers that we want to work with. We are bringing the collaboration together. So it's a true bringing the two together, the musicians and the dancers as one to be in an ensemble. And that's, I think, Annette, that's a really important part of what you were talking about earlier on as well. You don't have big fleets of tap dancers or doing a sort of a long line of choreography. It's, you are, the, you've got the same relationship as the drummer or the bass player, the rhythm section and same. And, uh, and I love that sort of um, that empathy and that ebb and flow that Kat and Nancy were both talking about. So with that in mind, Kat, you have put together a video of, um, I won't take Sue with Thunder, I'll let you introduce it. And then um, I know Nancy, you've also put together a video to share with everybody. Just to remind everyone, these videos, as well as being part of this conversation, we will put them on our YouTube channel so that you can see them in isolation. So if you want to follow any of the steps and, and repeat and really absorb and learn not just as a dancer I think it's really important whether you're going to play an instrument with the dancer or to be the dancer 
I think just like when you're working with uh, s singers, you need to know the lyrics of the songs. And you, ne you need to be knowing what the dancers are doing in the steps. It will inform your playing. So, you know, absorb the steps. But watch the video. If uh, the young musicians play along to the, once you hit, see the steps, you can maybe think about what um, repertoire you already know that best suits those steps. Um, and then maybe even in, invite some dancers to come and join your band because there are so many informal ensembles that youngsters are running. Let's make it so that, you know, it's it's a thing for the 2022, our 15th birthday, where young musicians are constantly working in partnership with dancers. Over to you, Kat. This is a small introduction to the Charleston. Enjoy. was popularised in the 1920s by dancers such as Josephine Baker. It's an African-American style of dance with roots in various forms such as Pat and Juba, the walk around and the cakewalk. Juba was a collective rhythm dance created by enslaved people of the transatlantic slave trade on American plantations and body percussion such as tapping the feet, slapping the legs and clapping the hands replaced the rhythm of drums that had been confiscated for fear of passing messages between one another. The fundamentals of Charleston are a pulse or a bounce on every beat, one, two, three, four, a tap or a step on the one and the three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and of course, as with lots of jazz, we begin on the pickup and one, two, three. Once you've got the basics, you can improvise around this theme using twists or kicks or anything really. I'll show you what it looks like. Dip the mouth blues and the Charleston. <laughs> thanks <laughs> it's got such energy it's great and i love the, how you explained it so that we can see the elements of improvisation using that framework so that there's that, that basic pulse that's there which which all of us need and then you know the uh, flourishes that you do by choosing which step is going to go where it's absolutely it's personal and so when people are dancing the charleston because you see them dancing in groups um, would would you pair up with somebody and do a bit of a reflection of each other or is it tending to be quite in isolation oh absolutely i think that the thing to say about um about swing dance environments is that everything is collaborative and that might be that you're dancing with one other person either holding hands or not like you say you might just have a little um visual conversation with somebody or very similar with tap or even if you think about hip hop and the idea of everyone getting around a circle and supporting one person in the center this is something that really really happens a lot especially when you have live music and because there's that feeling when you're in a big room when the band is suddenly really going for it and you feel that everyone comes together and then you'd have a bit more of a show off moment in a jam circle and like you say also the band hearing and seeing it because you do hear it, you hear the pulse of the dancing, you know, it is like having another percussion instrument as well. But seeing what's happening on the dance floor, you can't help but be drawn in as well. So it's, it's definitely a two way relationship. 
Thanks for explaining it, Kat. I think we're going to hand over to Nancy, who's also brought a video. And I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder. I'm just going to hand over to Nancy because you both put so, all three of you put so much time and effort into these beautiful videos. Over to you, Nancy. Well, thanks a lot, Izzy. Um, so what, what I prepared was something in Lindy Hop. We have a lot of different rhythms that we use. Um, and often we are stepping, we're tripling, we're kick stepping or we're kick tucking. And those words all mean different things. Um, and so I wanted to offer much as cat, we go from the Charleston to a basic eight count footwork that we start to do when we see dances like the breakaway, um, which then becomes encompassed within the Lindy Hop. And I have a little vintage clip um, in my segment that is from Hell's a Poppin, which is one of the sort of seminal pieces in the Lindy Hop canon uh, that showcases the creme de la creme of Whitey's Lindy Hoppers uh, and all of those dancers, which I will also pop the names of all those dancers if you want to Google them afterwards and check them all out of whom Kat and I have had the, the privilege of learning from. So uh, you're looking at the basic eight count uh, of Lindy Hop. Fantastic. See you later. Charleston, we have a very syncopated beat. And then as we get into the late 1920s and early 1930s, we start to see the breakaway where we have emphasis on every beat and where partners might break away from one another, coming back together. So we'd have a one, two, three, a four, a five, six, a seven, and eight. And triplets come into play, which is how we get our swing feeling when we dance to swing music. Brilliant. And what's fantastic about what you've just uh, mentioned there, Nancy, and I like the way that the three, we, we just by coincidence, we sort of struck the right order to show the videos because the thing that you hit on was about the rhythm and the triplets. And that's one of the things that I think when musicians who haven't worked with dancers before do work with the three of you for the first time, very quickly realize what a magical moment and a shared moment we've all got because the music we're playing is so rhythmic and you guys know exactly how to evoke that rhythm, lock into that rhythm, react to that rhythm. You are of that rhythm and that's what I think unifies everything that we're all doing is that shared love of rhythm. Rhythm is such a magical thing and uh, it can lift the spirit and, uh, um, and you can't help yourself but be lifted you know it's there's a power beyond all of us and it's the same when suddenly the vibe of a piece of music strikes up you know you can't it doesn't matter how miserable you feel it does lift your spirit that's why people listen to music and it's the same with the dancing as well um i'm wondering about when you're teaching these types of uh, dance routines to people um how long would you say uh, nancy if you were to sort of have a little bit of a routine that you thought oh, it'd be really nice to get youngsters together and actually for us all to learn it and put something into action how long would you normally allow for a, a short routine to for people to learn it i mean i feel confident that um cat annette and i can get everybody dancing in 15 to 20 minutes tops in the beginning because i think it's just about groove right it's about how do we and and i think we you know, you only have to listen to the first 30 seconds of a great song and some great people playing that song to really start to feel the pulse and the heartbeat in your body that is so life affirming. So I think for all of us, it's actually give us 10 to 20 minutes and let's get you inside the music. And then the depth of the knowledge base and the steps that we kind of layer on that 
are are um, they're not decorative. They're part of the intrinsic value and the the context of the dances we're teaching and the historic and social value of those dances. But it's very much like 10 to 20 minutes, we can get you grooving. Beyond that, we can teach you some steps. Beyond that, we can teach you the shim sham, you know? And I think it's those layers of, we really just believe that all people believe uh, should be able to make music be able to dance and to feel that life affirming joy to particularly to the music I think we're all kind of joined around right now. Others, well, like I, I feel like I want to open it up to Annette and Kat to answer this question too. So just to add to that, that there is that real sense when it of true sense of all the elements you've just talked about. Then we're talking about community as well. We're talking about everybody within the immediate vicinity being part of that. And Kat, you you've touched on it earlier on about when you're in the room, you can't help yourselves, but all be sort of become part of that community. It's infectious. Um, and I'm wondering, Kat, whether you might tell us about the project that you've just been doing, you know, that was um, funded by the Heritage Fund. Yeah, absolutely. We've just done a really great project with um, an organisation called Young Music Makers, who are based up in North London. Um, and the feeling that we wanted to kind of get across in that project was the idea of heritage and heritage in two ways. So how heritage um, is kind of a, a national thing, like what is our national heritage, but more importantly, what's our personal heritage? And, and our angle with that was what's our connection to music. And we had such a lovely set of sessions where we just asked the young people, what's your favourite song and what does that mean to you? Um, and then we had a broader conversation around the idea of commemoration around things like commemorative plaques and things and really asking who is commemorated and why and as obviously you know influence influence makers of the future how can we decide who gets commemorated and then what our legacy is as a as a collective going forward and um, so it's been a really exciting project to work with music and then what we did was we had a brand new piece of music composed by Misha Malov Adabo, which was amazing, brand new piece of jazz music. Um, and then the young people learned that, they did some amazing improvisation on it, and we layered on top of that the jazz dance and how it all fits together, thinking about the rhythm, the structure and the expression and how that relates between both music and dance. And did you do that, were you able to do that in person or were you doing working together online or both? We managed the first and the last session in person and then a lot of online stuff in the middle. Annette, how was uh, leading a jazz ensemble online? Yeah, yeah how was it, Annette? This was, this was a very new experience for me because it was a, a, the week before we went into lockdown too and it's like, well, now you're going to have to rehearse the band online. I'm like, what? A 10-piece youth jazz ensemble? <laughs> with a new piece of music that there's no kind of recordings that I can use as a reference. It was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was, um, I was fortunate that I'm quite techie. So I, I literally went into techie mode and I was able to utilize a kind of like online uh, or tools, software tools to, to try and find, rather than try and emulate, this is how we would do it in person because you're not in person you, you can't have that response that you do yeah. you know there's a delay so it's like what can we do online that will get people engaged and, and involved and it was very there's a lot more trust that I had to put in the young people in their playing because they were on mute uh, and I'm like leading them through a session generally maybe asking them a couple of times to unmute one person at a time so that I can check that they're actually you know getting it um but yeah there was, what was it, about four four of the sessions were online um and basically kind of like getting them up to speed uh learning the music uh, and then trying to you know find their way into improvising with this new piece of music uh and we didn't have the dancers and the musicians in the same space so there was a lot of elements of how do we uh, kind of expand into that mindset when you can't actually do it in the room. So there, there was quite a few few challenges, but uh, it, you know, it was we we did a pretty good job, I think. <laughs> what do you say? You had, you had the opportunity to bring everybody together. You, you had the fortune. Fantastic. 
So we've got one of our young musicians is with us who did the summer school and we've invited him to join us. Leo, would you like to come and join us? Because um, I know that Leo was particularly interested in what we were going to be talking about and was just interested in sort of hanging out and having a bit of a chat. So we thought it would be lovely um, to invite Leo to actually ask you a few questions. Yeah. Um, so I like, like I've got one holistic question, which is kind of how does um, how does the energy and dynamic between the performers change when you have a dancer and when you don't have a dancer in the performance? I just thought that was really yeah. Annette, do you want to maybe start with that one? Yeah. Um, you know what? It actually takes me back to one of the I've done many improvised gigs where it literally I turn up as a tap dancer uh, and. There's a band that I perhaps have never met before. Um, and this one particular time, uh, the band leader came over. They were from America, jazz, with their own music. And they were like, can you guys improvise on our music? Uh, and we were kind of like, yeah, sure, we'll give that a try. This is literally just all in the moment. It's very Will Gaines, all very much in the moment. And I remember there were three of us, three dancers, um, and we, you know, we got into the music. It was great. We were having a ball. But there was this moment where we we were like, this isn't like the usual 4-4. Four -four. There's something else going on with this music. So we're kind of finding our way through the music with the music. And the musician, the band leader came to us afterwards and he was like, oh, I could see my music. It became visual. Oh, what a great phrase. Yeah, and that, and that always stuck with me because that's effectively what we do as, as dancers. You get to see the music. And that's a dynamic that... Um, affects both the dancers and the musicians because like dancers quite often now these days it's a lot of putting on you know music and in the studio and you don't have the musicians there so when you physically have the musicians there it completely changes the dynamic for the dancers and it's a similar thing with the musicians it's like the music comes to life you can now see it and when you've got the visibility of both of you in the space you vibe off of that it becomes quite organic yeah, and is the and is the like the relationship between the dancer and the dancer is similar to the musician and the musician, like support wise, because as you just spoke about that, and I thought I would ask that. Maybe Kat could follow on from Annette. I mean, this is such a great question, and yes, a hundred percent. And again, it's quite common that um, that there'll be a brand new collaboration will happen, and this is largely something that Izzy is addressing by actually trying to make better links happen but mostly a band will be hired and then the dancers will be hired I mean it's like you can make that work right and on the spot you're like uh yep <laughs> no problem and what we all have to be able to do is adapt right and I would say that like as a dancer especially if you're a single dancer or just two people and there's a five-piece band then of course that dynamic is that you know the dancers are going to be more on the listening side at the beginning while you lock in but then from there you you can start to really adjust the energy between each other um and there's certainly some very magical moments where you 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 lock in and you both just go super chill at the same moment or you both really hit the roof at the same moment um yeah i love it oh live music man brilliant question leo have you been so good for nancy that's fine uh, yeah i've got a question for nancy so like what kind of, or what does dancing amplify in the music? And where it, does it add something or does it kind of bring something that's already present to life? Again, these are, these are dynamite questions. I, can, I will not speak for my colleagues, but I can tell you when I, when I dance, um, I'm an instrumentalist. I'm not, I'm not a bystander. I'm not an enhancement. I'm not the frill or the bow. I am intrinsically tied to the rhythm and I am participating in the conversation with the band. And, you know, when, uh, when I used to take class with uh, Frankie Manning, who was in the clip that, um, that was briefly shown in, in the eight count video in Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, you know, he used to talk about, you know, the relationship between you and your partner, but also you, your partner and the music and the musicians and how, what that interplay was. And I think, um, I've always felt like I'm an instrumentalist. So where, where do I sit in the music? I, I hang back on the beat because if the music, if the musicians are playing, then my, and often I'm following 
then the leader is a little bit behind. The band is hanging back on the beat. The leader's hanging a little bit back on the band. And then I'm hanging back on both of those. And all three of those things have to work in this continual conversation to really get the best stuff. And that's when you get those moments of um, serendipity that we all have. And, you know, I remember years ago at uh, one celebration uh, for uh, Frankie Manning's 95th birthday, where you could feel in the ballroom 3,500 swing dancers dancing to a live band. And there was a break coming in the song and you felt the whole room building up with the musicians to this musical moment and breath and you watch the whole floor just lift and then land and go right back into it. And I think that that is the moment where you're like, were we all listening to the music and were we all taking that rest in the same way at the same moment? And that's the stuff that gives you goosebumps and is I think part of the magic of live music making. So I think we exist as dancers, as instrumentalists to participate and where we get lost sometimes is by thinking that the music is simply a metronome. And I think that happens sometimes. And I think that's a real shame because I think that's also why we don't get opportunities to work in a really collaborative, meaningful way with bands and with musicians because we're, uh, we're perceived as an add-on as opposed to something that is in dynamic relationship with and participating instrumentalists. And, and Leo, your role as a pianist really resonates with what what the three are speaking about much more i think there'd be great empathy if a drummer was here saying yeah i'm not here to keep your time uh but leo you're already engaging you it's, it's more easily permissible be for a pianist to be comping and choosing the rhythms of when you're going to be placing your notes and how you're interacting within the tapestry so i'm wondering what your reaction is to um to talking you know hearing the conversation and has it made you think about how you might go away and rethink experiment a little bit What's yeah i mean like i've always when comping i've thought of it as kind of accompanying and then i've thought of it as a, a complimenting and i thought the most important thing is that, that i have to provide the space for the soloist when they're soloing and i was just kind of uh reminded by that when you said that kind of sense of the dynamic being present as its own kind of thing or its own kind of space in the in the space between the performers and I thought I should really kind of go ahead and figure that space out. I know that Wynton Kelly is a, a really or Miles Davis's favorite uh, accompanist because he provides a lot of space and so I'll, I'm going to listen to a lot of him but yeah. Right and that's that ever... important. That ebb and flow, you know, of accompanying and complimenting, but also, you know, uh, evoking and provoking and leading and, and that constant change and shift that there's no one person that retains that that role for very long. It's just a constant tapestry, isn't it? What I would like to suggest, Leo, is because I know we were going to ask you to play today and I'm wondering, because of running out of time slightly, whether we might invite you back again to play and whether we might leave you for a little while between now and when you come to play to have a little bit of a think about what we've been talking about and see whether you might actually come up with a piece that is in response to our conversation. Sure, for sure. All right. Brilliant. So stick with us for as we round off. We're going to um, Annette and Kat and uh, Nancy, you put together a lovely video for our Christmas um, party. And we thought we would round off with reminding everybody of it and encouraging people to follow the steps and have a dance. Because I'm sure by now, surely everybody that's watching is not sitting down anymore. If it were for the fact that I'm sitting here talking into my camera, I'd be up and dancing. So um, before we um, invite everybody and uh, to join with that video at the end uh, for, I'd like to invite our where have you gone I can't see the little logo I'd like to invite our wonderful program manager Nick Brown back are you still with us yeah hello I'm still here loving the conversation tonight very very nice you've been playing along with your saxophone I wish I wish I've been clicking buttons <laughs> but not not saxophone buttons <laughs> but I can't wait for us all to come together and to be able to do it. I mean, Nick and I will be there with our baritone and tenor sax when we do the project. So won't, we won't just leave it to the young musicians. We'll be there as well. So, Nick, uh, remind us if people want to hear about more of the work we're doing, because we are going to be announcing regional projects and during the summer school, um, inviting people to workshops, very much wanting uh, Annette and Kat and Nancy to come up to Derbyshire where we're running the summer school this year to lead some workshops. Things are looking 
really good. At the, uh, we've been doing our constant every day. It's a risk assessment. <laughs> so, um, so how does one find out about all this exciting, uh, all these different ideas that we've been developing and we are bringing them out into real life soon? So to stay up to date with all things NYJC, so whether you're a young musician, a music practitioner, a tutor, or a parent, you can just head to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash sign up. The other exciting thing that we're working on is I've just finished the uh, sort of consultation and research and development stage of developing a programme of online teaching videos, which we'll be talking much more about. I think we're going to talk on the 30th of April, because that's um, all round about then, 28th that's near international jazz day so we thought it'd be nice to sort of by then we'll have put some of them together and we can talk about the program but um, it's been fantastic i've been w w talking to so many music services and schools and practitioners who are so excited about the whole idea of working with us and bringing much more jazz and improvisation into this, where they work so it's not just the jazz instruments you know it's definitely I'm hoping that soon, long gone will be the day when if a trombone player walks in, you go, oh, you're automatically in the jazz ensemble. And then a viola player walks in, it's like, no, you're not. You're in the symphony orchestra. Let's everybody have a go, you know, all instruments. And there's a fantastic video that um, uh, North Derbyshire just shared with me earlier on around the Glossop area. And there was oboes taking solos and, and bassoons. And it's like, yeah, can't wait. Come and work with us. And then let's have a dance as well. But um, as we know, we've been writing a lot of funding applications recently to develop things for NYJC. Um, and we know that as the summer school approaches with the audition tour that we're going to be doing, they're all free, the auditions. 50, they cost £50. They cost us £50 each. And we underwrite all of that because we want to make sure that we meet every young musician that's interested in the music. So even if you're not sure, if you think, I don't know whether I'd get onto the summer school or not, honestly, please don't worry about that. I would love you to come to the auditions to meet us so that we can signpost you to all the different activity that we're um, leading and to go around the country and have that wonderful opportunity of meeting, you know, 100, 150 young musicians That'd be fantastic. So please do um, come and audition. How do you sign up for the auditions? You're going to be opening the uh, audition uh, again. I'll let you explain. Yes, so the auditions are going to be uh, opened again, uh, applications, and the deadline will be some at some point in May for those. Uh, but to, to sign up, the, the uh, old system is still up there, up there at the moment. It will be updated. But if you just go to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash summer dash school, um, you can find out all the information there about how to audition and more information also about the summer school. And the reason that we are um, opening up again is because we're pushing the auditions back to the half term week because uh, the roadmap just doesn't quite allow for us to do the auditions during the Easter fortnight. But we've had a conversation with Repton and they are really excited about the fact that the last week of August we're going to be up there and they feel very confident um, about the fact that we'll be able to go ahead with that. So it's just the timing of the roadmap. We can't quite make it work for the Easter fortnight. So that's why we thought, well, well, if we're moving it to the half term, then why don't we um, open it up? Because we have got a few places left in some of the regions. And we, as I say, we're really keen to meet everyone. So with that in mind, with us being so keen to meet everyone, a lot of people are struggling financially at the moment because of people self-employed. Great to hear on the news today that all of the support's been extended till September. So nice one uh, to our Chancellor of the Exchequer. But um, more in-house, if somebody needs a bit of financial support, how do we go about doing that? We're going to offer bursaries and we could do with a bit of help with our bursary fund. So if you'd like to support NYJC and its commitment to making our work accessible to all young musicians, no matter their financial background, please head to nationalyouthjazz.co.uk forward slash donate. And we will be expanding that. So as we bring more dance into the programme, then those bursaries will also be available for dancers that come and work with us as well. So basically anybody that's working with us, we're really keen to make sure they stay plugged in because it, it is a collective, it's a community, it's a family, it's a... Uh, a community of shared interest and I think love and passion for what we're doing so and once you're with us that's it we'll we'll be there forever and I think you can vouch for that can't you Nick because um, having graduated and lots of the mates that you met on the summer school you're still in touch with still making music with absolutely yeah from 2012 those people have, have stayed friends and I'm sure they will be friends uh, for lifelong 
So and I think that is the that is the NYJC story from everyone that once once you meet NYJC and the people that you meet on that on that on the courses, um, you you won't ever forget them, and they won't ever forget you. I'm sure Annette and Kat and Nancy, maybe you would join us. I'm sure that's true also of the dance community, isn't it? Once you meet each other. So maybe if you come off mute and we can say a fond farewell to you all. So I think you guys are going to be staying together, working together. And I'm really glad that you're part of our community and are going to be coming and bringing. I've already. Go on, Nancy. What were we going to say? No, I was going to say, I've already said to Kat and Annette on various occasions, I'm like, I'm really sorry you're stuck with me. <laughs> I'm sure that they're thrilled and, and I like your sense of humour it's fantastic so as we wrap up um, Annette, Kat, Nancy um, I hope that you've enjoyed this evening any headlines sort of as the outcome of the conversation Annette any, any parting words oh, just keep feeling the groove guys <laughs> <laughs> definitely Kat oh 100% let's when we can be in a room together let's do that Definitely, we'll be turning on a penny and making it happen really quickly. And to round up, Nancy, any last words? Stay safe out there until we see each other again. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for being part of this today. And everybody watching, as Nancy says, to stay safe. And as Kat and uh, Annette have said, keep staying with the groove because we need it. When we're let out of lockdown, we'll all be of it. And what a sound that's going to be. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. And uh, we've got the fantastic Ingrid Jensen joining us from Canada, composer, uh, and who's going to be with us for our 15th birthday next year. So come and hear about Ingrid's music and her sister as well. Um, so, no, Christine is who we're going to see tomorrow, next week, and then her sister, Ingrid Jensen as well. So uh, join us next week. But for now, I think, Nick, we're wrapping up because we've had an incredible week. It's time for a cup of tea. See you all soon.